Threats and Vulnerabilities, Chapter 6. Throughout much of our course, with a few exceptions, such as in Chapter 5, where we talked about web application attacks, most of our attention has been directed towards best practices and proper safeguards to protect your valuable information assets from unauthorized use. In this chapter, we want to take a closer look at threats and vulnerabilities that's required for the Security Plus knowledge objectives. Number one, we want to analyze and differentiate among different types of malware, network attacks, wireless attacks, both Wi-Fi, the 802.11 technology, as well as Bluetooth. We previously covered the concept of application attacks, such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting. That was covered in Chapter 5, but this is all part of what you need to know in preparing for the Security Plus exam. Also, we want to take a look at social engineering attacks, and they've taken on many different forms with the advent of widespread use of email and electronic messaging in general. Also, we want to be able to determine the different types of mitigation and deterrent techniques that we can use. Another key area is identifying your vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. And this is where we're going to go out and use different types of assessment tools and techniques to discover threats and vulnerabilities. By the way, if you're interested in a more in-depth, advanced approach, Security University offers the Qualified Information Security Professional Program that provides extensive practical training in applying these techniques in identifying the threats, vulnerabilities, and properly protecting from them. And within these vulnerability assessments, we need to understand how to do pen testing and compare it to vulnerability testing. So our agenda for this chapter, first of all, we're going to look at the dreaded malware attacks. And then we're going to expand and look at different types of attacks that could be launched against any type of network environment. And then we move into the land of wireless. And this is where we look at WLAN and Bluetooth attacks. And then we go more to a personable approach towards attacks versus using technology. Let's play psychological games with people. And this can entail things such as fishing, spear fishing, and whaling. Sounds like we're going on a big fishing expedition. Also, we want to take a look at how to deal with detecting and defending against all these dastardly deeds. And this would include intrusion detection. When it starts to take action, automatically it would be intrusion prevention. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to take a close look at vulnerability and penetration testing. And then we'll wrap up the chapter with highlighting the key points you need to be familiar with in preparing for the exam and then turning it loose on some more practice tests. So let's take a look first at malware attacks, and let's define malware. This is software that disrupts or overloads systems and or damages your data. Obviously not things you want to have happen to your valuable systems. One of the things you need to be familiar with for the Security Plus exam is the definitions for different types of malware. Now, from your previous experience and from other references you may use outside the realm of Security Plus, you may have different definitions for these types of malware. Set those aside. We need to make sure we're following the consistent thread of what Security Plus defines these different malware agents as. First of all, let's talk about the most common one, the one that's been around the longest, computer viruses. These are programs that search out other programs and infects them by embedding a copy of itself. And we're going to talk about different types of viruses later on. And yes, you have to be familiar with those for the Security Plus exam. And then we go out into autopilot mode, if you will. We'll talk about worms. Worms are a self-contained program that can reproduce on its own without the need for other software. Although normally it needs some type of exploitable vulnerability to propagate. For example, the Code Red, the NIMDA, the different slammer attacks and such. If you haven't patched your systems, these open up opportunities for these worms to infect your system and often use you as a launching point to also attack other systems. We have logic bombs. Over the years, there's been some famous logic bombs, such as the Chernobyl bomb that went off in honor of the meltdown of the nuclear energy plant in the Soviet Union. There was the Michelangelo virus that would activate on the birth date celebration of Michelangelo. Certainly you don't want to be celebrating having a virus take over your system, but again, the uh, writers of these logic bombs want to honor famous events in history, 
at your expense. Trojan horses, if you think back to mythological times where a big wooden horse was given as a gift, unfortunately, the wooden horse had unwanted content, most notably soldiers that once they were inside the secure fortress would then go out and attack the owner of the fortress. Same concept when we're talking about software. We have what appears to be a useful program, maybe some type of utility or more commonly a game. So you download it, start playing with it. While you're installing it or playing with it, there's some hidden code that comes out and bypasses security and can cause all kinds of bad events depending on the designer's objectives. Also, over the past 10 years, there's been Trojan horses that are in the form of remote control programs, some of the most notable, Sub-7, Back Orifice, and Netbus. These are like remote hacker consoles that if you had the Trojan horse planted on your system, you could literally do a push-button attack. I actually demonstrated some of these concepts in live TV programs in the Middle East. 